Welcome to the Save Me Lives podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. For historical context, today, as I look at my watch, is the 10th of May of 2021. And I'm trying something a little bit different here because I want to be able to spread this education via both the podcast medium, which you're probably listening to right now on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever, but I'm also trying to do this on YouTube as well. And just having my voice on YouTube isn't going very well, so I'm adding some video to this so you can see me talk about it if you want to do that sort of weird thing. But in addition to that, I am going to have some slides from the actual presentations and without violating any type of uh, YouTube regulations or whatnot. But nonetheless, uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, please like because it definitely helps the YouTube algorithm. It helps the actual channel grow and get to more people and therefore more people get taken care of properly. And if you're listening to this podcast on whatever other medium, thank you so much for your support. I greatly appreciate it. So today I'm going to be discussing cardiac power output because a lot of us who are in the intensive care unit, and for those who don't know me, I'm an intensivist. I take care of a lot of patients who are in cardiogenic shock, and it seems to be one of the four different types of shock that is not as sexy, if, if that's the correct terminology, because everybody's just fascinated with septic shock, and everybody who has an elevated lactate is in septic shock, but those of us with a little bit of experience know that if you manage a patient who is in cardiogenic shock, like somebody who is in septic shock, you will actually uh, make things worse for them and they will not do well. So that being said, what I'm going to be discussing today is cardiac power output, which is a good hemodynamic correlate for whether our patient is going to do in cardiogenic shock. At the end of the day, in our guts, we want to do the normal things that we've always done, the things that we are comfortable with. And that includes monitoring mean arterial pressure, the patient's heart rate, lactate, you know, those types of parameters. Heck, we might even get a little bit more fancy. And when I say fancy, I'm actually talking about a technology that's been here for decades now, and that's the pulmonary artery catheter, which some people call a swan, such as myself. And the swan lets us uh, obtain other hemodynamic parameters, such as the wedge pressure, the stroke volume, and the cardiac index. Bottom line is that at the end of the day, just looking at the mean arterial pressure, looking at the blood pressure is not going to cut it for our patients. And we really, really do owe it to them to do better. Okay, so data that was published back in 2004, right now it's 2021. So, you know, it's been about 15 years, suggested that looking at cardiac power output was the way to go. And this was a study that was done by Fink and his colleagues where they looked at patients who were enrolled in the shock trial. And what they found was that the cardiac power was the, quote, strongest independent hemodynamic correlate of in-hospital mortality. Therefore, if your CPO is low, it correlates with in-hospital mortality. And so I know that many people use mean arterial pressure as the end-all be-all for hemodynamics. But to be honest, if you're doing this, in my opinion, which could be wrong, those people are playing in the little leagues. We, we got to step it up to the big leagues. But the good news is that it does not take much to be promoted to the big leagues, which is why I emphasize that we need to take a deeper dive into the mean arterial pressure equation. The reason why I want to dive into the mean arterial pressure equation is because mean arterial pressure is cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. Okay, and that's very important. And some, some people will go ahead and add in the CVP. I'm not gonna get into that to complicate this. I just need you to understand that mean arterial pressure is equal to cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. And I've said this on many posts before on my social media channels, YouTube, Instagram, etc. But our management of these patients depends on our ability to sort out the cardiac output, especially in these patients with cardiogenic shock. And you remember that cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. So things that we could work on to try to improve on our patients is if the patient needs more heart rate, give them more heart rate. If they need more stroke volume, you go ahead and you give them more stroke volumes. You could add inotropes or in the case of this post and what I'm trying to get to is the addition of mechanical circulatory support because the other thing that you can measure or the other thing that you could uh, tweak, so to speak, is the systemic vascular resistance. And this is where you go ahead and, um, what's it called, add pressures to these patients. 
And again, some texts may add the CVP to the mean arterial pressure equation, but again, that's beyond the scope of this particular podcast, post, video, whatever. So to reiterate, just looking at the map, it fails to point out whether the issue is an issue with the cardiac output or the systemic vascular resistance. And I have seen clinicians go ahead and add vasopressors, you know, oh, the levels at 5, as levels at 10, the levels at 15, into oblivion. And what that does is that creates too much afterload for the failing heart to even know what to do with it, okay? So, you know, it's like, it's like if somebody's at the gym, right, and they're just trying to do the best that they can with their bench press, and then you go ahead and you add another plate to it, in other words, increasing the afterload or clamp down on the patient, so to speak, yeah, it's going to make the mean arterial pressure look pretty for a while, but there's going to be a moment where you can't lift the bar off of your chest. It's just not going to happen. But again, I digress with the gym references. So how do you calculate the cardiac power output, which is the whole the whole purpose of this particular podcast. And to do that, it's the CPO is equal to the mean arterial pressure, and I hope you have an A-line in these patients, but again, I digress, times the cardiac output, and you put both of these into parentheses, mean arterial pressure and cardiac output, and you divide this whole number by 451. Again, we're playing in the big leagues, guys. You're taking care of patients who are in cardiogenic shock you're gonna need to measure the cardiac output or the cardiac index correctly in these patients. And there was a recently published study that showed the the NICOM devices. And again, these are all linked in the description box below on my website where I have links to all these articles. Because at the end of the day, I want you to read these articles and not trust me. But this this paper shows that the NICOM devices are not as good as a PA catheter to do these comp, these uh, calculations. Excuse me, but again, I figure it's better to if you have these devices at your at your institution to give them a go, rather than go in completely blind and try to manage these patients off of mean arterial pressure. Now, I know that there's there are people out there who say that using PA catheters, excuse me, as I scratch my nose, um, that using a PA catheter is has no improvement in mortality but i just want to link in the description box that there's an article that's titled complete hemodynamic profiling with pulmonary artery catheters in cardiogenic shock is associated with lower in hospital mortality so now there's data that using pa catheters improves mortality in cardiogenic shock patients unfortunately that article is not free but if there's a will there's a way as the saying goes i hope that if you're caring for a patient who is in cardiogenic shock that you at least have a reliable arterial line in place and in addition to that they most likely need a PA catheter or something to go ahead and measure their cardiac index or cardiac output. Now the Matt Shuba Zentensivist part of me obviously likes to avoid unnecessary procedures but again I will reiterate this numerous times the mortality for cardiogenic shock over the last couple years has been around 50%. So the reality is that there is no time to be messing around with these patients, especially since there's very good data that suggests that delaying care in these patients skyrockets their mortality and they're just not gonna do well. So we need to act on them, we need to act fast, efficiently, and save their lives. So which cardiac power output should we shoot for? Well, the data suggests that you should shoot for a CPO greater than 0.6. Now. A cardiac power output of less than 0.6 is a poor prognostic indicator. So if you have a SWAN in place and you're getting your numbers, but the management isn't cutting it, right? You know, the CPO isn't happy, your patient isn't doing well, it's time to go ahead and step up your game. How do you say? Well, it's time to call, call up your friendly neighborhood interventional cardiologist to go ahead and place some sort of mechanical circulatory support device. Now. If your friendly neighborhood interventional cardiologist can't do it, to be honest with you, it's time to go ahead and phone a friend, call a neighboring facility. I know I personally have relationships with the neighboring facilities at my, in my city, and if I can't get something done, I transfer them out. Re- remember that ego does not save lives. Transferring patients who are appropriate to be transferred to other facilities does potentially save their lives. One of the other things that I'm going to go over in a later video or podcast is the PAPI score, which is the pulmonary artery pulsatility index to see if right-sided assistance is also necessary. But again, I'm going to go away from that and just 
I just want to go ahead and, and illustrate the fact that we need to be aware that the more recent studies that have shown an improvement from the default 50% mortality in cardiogenic shock have used the cardiac power output, the CPO, as an overall marker for how their heart is doing and left ventricular function. So the question is, how do I use cardiac power output in my practice? And it's really quite simple, but it's not actual medical advice. This is an example of how I triage patients in my mind who are going through cardiogenic shock and how I manage them. And I use a threshold of cardiac index of 2.2 as my worry cutoff. You might say to yourself, well, Eddie, you know, a normal range for cardiac index is between 2.5 and 4 liters per minute per meter squared. And one has to remember that these patients who are in cardiogenic shock are not normal patients. Sometimes shooting for perfection is not the right thing to do for these patients. After all, they are in cardiogenic shock. Once I see that their index and cardiac output, which, you know, one can get the cardiac output on the, on the swan box as well or on the actual monitor itself, I check to see how much support they're receiving from either vasopressors and or inotropes. And at the same time, I looked at the cardiac index or the cardiac output, I also go ahead and glance at the systemic vascular resistance. And systemic vas vascular resistance, if you can't have it show up on your screen, is calculated by being the mean arterial pressure minus the CVP, both of those things together, divided by cardiac output. And the way that you're looking at the systemic vas vascular resistance, excuse me, and determining if it's too high, you know, in other words, greater than 1200, what I do is that I ask my nurses to go ahead and start coming down on the vasopressors if they are on vasopressors. You might be providing your patient with too much afterload. And if you know the patient was receiving too much afterload, you go ahead and you turn down the vasopressin or you turn down the levofed a little bit. What you might actually see is an improvement of the cardiac output or the cardiac index. And this is when you want to go ahead and calculate your CPO. The reason why is because you don't want to, even though you don't want to delay care, you also don't want to pull a trigger prematurely and calculate a CPO that's inappropriate, again, because they were on too much jet fuel. And because at the end of the day, we don't want our patients to go through any unnecessary procedures, you know, unless they really have to. Again, all these things that we do are extremely expensive. <laughs> so we want to try to save as much money as we can for the hospital systems and our patients. But once I go ahead and see that, I also ask, excuse me, I also ask the nurses if they've been going up or coming down on their vasopressors or inotropes as they're titrating it per the protocols. And if the patient has been getting sicker and the CPO is also less than 0 0.6, I go ahead and I make the call. Heck, even if the patient is trending in the wrong direction where I feel that fear that they might need mechanical circulatory support in a short amount of time, I go ahead and I make a call to the interventional cardiologist to give them a heads up, so to speak. After all, our interventional cardiology friends need to call in the squad that works in the cath lab, and that's a significant amount of resources. They have to mobilize, you know, sometimes in excess of three to four people. Again, making the call to transition to mechanical circulatory support changes the dynamics with regards to cost of device, but in addition to that, a more significant amount of people are needed to care for these patients. A lot of times it's on a one-to-one -one ratio with regards to the nursing staff, so keep that in mind. My point to all this is that these patients need a significant amount of brain power and attention to detail to save their lives. Getting over the 50% mortality hump needs a very good interdisciplinary team to go ahead and sort them out. All in all, to sum up everything, I hope you guys learned something from this podcast, podcast slash video. Please leave me a good review if you learned anything from it on Apple, if you haven't done so already. If you're watching this on YouTube, thank you so much. Please hit the like button because it really helps out the YouTube algorithm to promote my channel and help everything grow. Um, also, subscribe, share with your friends, all that good stuff. Hope you guys have a great day and good luck taking care of your cardiogenic shock patients. Also, remember not to trust me and to check out all of the information on the show notes below uh, so you can get the articles for yourself and read them for yourself. That's, that's my motivation here is for you to read these studies for yourself. Hope you guys have a great day. Thanks a lot. Bye.